OK, it is 2 10 PM and it looks like we have at least a majority of committee members, so we'll go ahead and get started. I see that the recording is on. Desiree, please correct me if I am mistaken. It's on. Thank you. OK, welcome everybody. This is a meeting of the Municipal Audit Committee. It is Thursday, May 20th, 2021. We are noticed from 2.10 to 3.10 p.m. My name is Suzanne LaFrance. I'm the chair of this committee. We will go ahead and begin with a roll call. Ms. Camacho, please. Thank you. Is Ms. LaFrance? Here. Ms. Allard? Here. Mr. Rivera? Present. Ms. Henderson? Mr. Slivka? Ms. Morrison? Present. Great, thank you, Ms. Camacho. I want to note, um, <clears throat> excuse me, for any members of the public who may be joining, that the documents for this meeting are online. If you go to muni.org, click on Assembly, go to Committees on the left, and scroll down to Municipal Audit Committee, you will find the agenda for today's meeting, as well as the Internal Audit Report 2021-03 Annual Municipal Procurement Card Review available online. So um, we'll go ahead and turn to our agenda. We have several items of new business. First, a discussion of potential CARES Act hospitality relief funds audit. Second, a discussion of potential Anchorage tax cap calculation audit. Third, internal audit report 2021-03 annual municipal procurement card review Pur purchasing department. And D, an update on the status of preparation of the comprehensive annual financial report. And then E, other business. Does anyone have anything else they'd like to add to the agenda? All righty, we'll go ahead and get started with the first item. And um, Ms. Allard, I believe um, you are dialing in via phone. And the first two items actually were added by you. And so if, um, if you could go ahead with the first one. And I will just um, note that our practice, our policy, um, is that the committee discusses, reviews, and then votes on um, whether to add any new audits. And then of course, we need to address any resource issues in terms of staff time um, and, and time you know, to complete it, as well as funding source. So Ms. Allard, if you wanna go ahead and um, begin the discussion, on the first one, the CARES Act Hospitality Relief Funds Audit, um, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair LaFrance. So uh, the, the reason I was bringing those up, and I think it was prior maybe to the audit being triggered with the Department of Treasury, and I'm not really sure on that status. So I was looking at having the hospitality, CARES Act Hospitality Relief Funds being audited. And there's a couple of reasons why, and it was brought to my attention this is a good place to discuss it. So a few people had reached out to me in the community and a prior employee of the municipality had also reached out and said that they felt that the CARES Act funds were doled out improperly by, we were supposed to use the first and second groups that were going out with the fund. They were specifically targeted restaurants or individuals within the hospital, that fell underneath the hospitality. And that it was on the decision, even though it went out from Cook Inlet, it wasn't necessarily done by lottery. And so this employee came to me and said that it was by decision of the municipality and the administration of which restaurants would get what before who. And if they were a member of the char, that they would receive funds before anybody else. So they alerted all these businesses um, that fell underneath char and at zero nine o'clock it was triggered that those people would get funds before anybody else but it wasn't by lottery so I had some concerns on that 
and if it was true. And I felt that the only way to find out if it was accurate information was to do an audit in regards to that. Then they said that the third group was done by lottery, but they said that individuals that were not um, of, uh, of a certain group um, demographics, they would not qualify. And because of their skin color, they were discriminated against. And this was an individual that worked closely with this department with Cook Inlet and deciding what restaurant. This individual went on to say that they were later removed from doing it because the administration felt that they moved too slowly and that they were asking too many questions. And then they eventually moved into another department and then eventually they were let go. So this is what triggered me to want to have the Hospitality Relief Fund audited. And Ms. LaFrance, did you want me to stop there so we could discuss how, how do you want me to proceed? I, I know it was loaded, but. Uh. Thank you, Ms. Allard. Appreciate that information and um, what uh, folks had contacted you about. And I guess the question um, would be, well, first of all, clearly there needs to be follow up on um, the allegations and um, the statements that were made. And my question, and, and this would be to others, um, is the audit committee is doing an audit the best way to do that? And maybe it is. Um, this is something I probably will need to get a little more information about, Ms. Allard. It, it very well may be, um, but if I think we could definitely have some uh, discussion about that. And then just if anyone else wants to raise, you know, any other issues, I think this is a good time for some discussion if um, anyone uh, would like to get into the queue. Or if there's anyone from the administration who would like to speak, I see, oh, okay, Felix, Mr. Rivera. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so for my purposes, I want to know a little bit of um, what an audit would complete that the other audit that Treasury is doing of all um, 50 states, um, not just uh, Anchorage or Alaska, but all 50 states, how that audit would be different than the audit that um, is, is being proposed now. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Rivera. Ms. Aller, do you want to go ahead and address that question? Right. Uh, so I don't know if the Department of Treasury is going to go into the discrimination factor or if there were people that were put in place based on their color or was it because of they know somebody or they didn't know somebody. So it's a direct connection to whether or not they're going to look into, like if you do a Department of Treasury audit, they're gonna look and say, nope, these funds were allowed to go out, they were allowed to go out this time and this particular restaurant would qualify for it. That's, that's the way the feds would do an audit. But are they gonna go into deep with, okay, were they discriminated against based on their race? Were they discriminated against because they didn't know the facility, they didn't know uh, a connection with a person that had the authority to put that money out? And did we actually do it by lottery? So those are questions that I have, but I wouldn't know necessarily what the Department of Treasury is going to actually look for. Maybe they're just looking for the fiscal part, and that would have to be a question that would have to be answered probably by the administration of, are we being audited just solely to make sure we did right by the fund? Or is there a whole nother piece of, I guess it would go, fall under equal opportunity, EEO. Is that a whole nother spy? I, I think it's EEO, just equal opportunity, not employment. And I, I would have to ask the administration if they can chime in to give us the definition of what the Department of Treasury is actually looking at for lines of their audit. Thank you, Ms. Allard. Um, is there someone from the administration here who's able to speak to that point as to what the Treasury audit will cover? 
Uh, just, this is go ahead. go ahead, Molly. I'll be quiet. I was going to say I don't know. <laughs> so this is Alex Lipka, CFO. What, what I would say is, um, A, the Treasury audit won't happen until the CARES thing is done, which is going to be the end of this year. It seems like if this person has an allegation that they weren't treated correctly, they need to act as an individual. Um, you know, we operated a process and uh, with a contract with a contractor. Um, and so if this person believes that they weren't treated appropriately, um, I, I think that's where they start. Uh, but I, I think what, based on you know what you've said, Ms. Allard, I think we should run the question by MOA Legal and have them tell us what we think the next steps are. I think that's our best next step now that we understand what kind of information you're looking for. Well, thank you, uh, Chair. May I respond? I apologize. Oh no, that's fine, Ms. Allard. Go ahead. Um, and I agree with you on some parts of that, Mr. Sliska, but there's another part where I would disagree, and that is the fact that there's a reason this person doesn't want to come forward. And if a constituent or anybody within the Anchorage municipality brings things to my attention, I don't always think that we have to go through legal. I don't always think we have to go through filing. I think that as just a straight up audit could be the easiest way to, uh, to, to rectify this situation because here's what I'm going to say. If it didn't happen, it didn't happen. If it did happen, then an audit will show that it happened. And that's where I want to do because I do recall during an assembly meeting that we wanted to put in the section where, uh, and it was, it was what was allowed by federal law, maybe state law too, that if they put in your demographics, what race you were, your poverty level, how much money, it was optional on whether you answered those questions or not. So depending, there's a reason we did that. And the reason we did that was so that nobody was discriminated against. So I believe getting those numbers through an audit of, okay, let's run those numbers and find out if everybody was treat, treated equally and let the audit prove that there was a true definition of lottery for those funds I think that's a great way to go, but I, I wouldn't want the municipality to go down a legal avenue if we can absolutely just resolve it by an audit. Thank you, Ms. Allard. It looks like um, Mr. Rivera would like to follow up. Mr. Rivera? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. So um, I, I guess a, a couple of thoughts just based on some of the recent comments. So. Um, I think there there needs to be sort of a little bit of a separation of the issues here. So it sounds like there is a, an allegation of discrimination in in which case um, that would either go through the uh, I would assume the Anchorage Equal Rights Commission, or if it's um, an allegation that the proper um, policies weren't followed, that would possibly fall under the ombudsman's office if it is um the the other issue though battery and um trying to get a sort of an understanding of the well, hospitality good. relief were trying to get a uh, an understanding of how the hospitality relief funds were used or um, were granted to recipients. And, um, you know, for my part, um, if there is information that would help uh, to clarify how those funds were used, I mean, I think that's information the entire assembly would be interested in um, because. Uh, and the community at large would be interested in because th these are conversations that we had. We were worried as a body that, you know, disproportionately communities of color may not have access to these funds. So uh, um, having an understanding of how they were allocated to recipients would be helpful. I guess my question to Mr. Chadwick is, uh, is that a, a function that your office could do? And do you know if there is enough information to actually do something like that because as i understand it the information wasn't necessarily a requirement so it, it, we may not be able to provide a full picture so i'd be interested to hear from mr chadwick on that 
Yeah. Mr. Rivera through the chair. I don't know how much information was provided. We haven't looked at that, so I, I'm unable to answer that that question. Um, this is something that we could possibly look at, but it would really depend on what kind of information was provided and how much we have of it. Thank you, Mr. Chadwick. Mr. Rivera, did you want to follow up? No follow up right now. Thank you. Thanks. And Ms. Allard, um, do you want to speak to what information is available? If, it's, um, if you want to just elaborate on that. Yeah, I just believe that we put those in place so that we could prevent any type of discrimination. And I believe we also put in place a lottery to prevent them from anybody else being favored. But if I'm getting any type of um, feedback saying that the lottery didn't actually take place or um, they were discriminating against others who may not fall into the realm of uh, uh, different races, then that's an issue and that's a concern. So I know that we as an assembly and an administration, we put those in place to prevent any of the things that are being accused of right now from happening. So what I'd also like to suggest is that because, and this is no offense to Mr. Chadwick, I do trust him, that because these are coming against the administration, I would think it would be better to use a third party um, to investigate what has actually happened, and I think that would go with the BDO. So this is this is something that I think is as an open and honest, out there and transparent, and the easiest and the simplest way is to just perform an audit, and that's it. And when I get any sort of a little bit of pushback, it, it I, and I'm going to be honest, it, it alerts me. It concerns me. Why would we even consider getting pushback of doing an audit of certain allegations that have come forward and that person really wants to be protected in the community? And I just think that let's show true transparency and let's just do it. Um, that's all I have to say on that one. And I don't know how would we address it in the future. Ms. Okay. Ryan. Well, thank you, Ms. Allard, and I believe, uh, you know, right now we're trying to get a clear sense of where it best fits and what resources are required. Um, now that I understand that your interest is to have a third party audit, I think um, perhaps either you and I could discuss offline with BDO, I mean, and to find out, um, you know, to hammer out the scope, to get the cost information, and to find out, um, you know, what they need. That's certainly one way we could go about it and happy to take it offline to um, get this information. Would that be a satisfactory approach for you? Sorry, I don't mean oh, to put absolutely. you on the spot. No, no, that, absolutely. That works perfectly fine. Totally. OK, so let's um, let's do that. You and I will talk and we will um, connect with BDO and perhaps Mr. Chadwick and anyone else um, just to provide some scoping and context. And actually, as we move into the next item concerning the tax cap calculation audit, we may want to um, adopt a similar approach because my understanding, Ms. Allard, is that you would like to have a third party audit there as well. And so um, again, in that case, we'll need scoping, we'll need cost, and of course, we'll need a source of funds. So up to you if you want to go ahead and um, speak to that one now. Yeah, this, this one's actually quite easy. <clears throat> it's really just because we haven't had a tax cap uh, calculation audit since uh, I believe 2016. And so I was just requesting that we have one through the BDO third party and we can discuss that offline as well. OK, thank you, Ms. Allard. And I see Mr. Rivera's in the queue. Uh, thank you. Um, so I guess my question is to Mr. Chad with a couple of questions. So first is, um, can you please send uh, committee members a copy of the 2016 audit? And then second, can you please speak to what this audit is, what it does, how frequently it happens, and um, who normally does this audit? Thanks. Mr. Rivera through the chair. There was a reference by Ms. Aller to a 2016 audit. This is not something that, this is not an audit that 
was done by internal audit. I don't know what audit that is referring to. This is we. The Office of Internal Audit has never looked at the tax cap. I not recall. I do not recall any special study either that uh, internal audit has done. So this is uh, this is something we've never looked at, and I'm not sure what 2016 audit was completed and and who completed that audit. If I can do a quick follow up, Madam Chair. Yes, of course, Mr. Rivera. Thanks. So we, we don't need to go into it now then, since it sounds like there's some offline work that we've done on this, but um, I would like all committee members to get a copy of that 2016 audit, and then any relevant information should also go to all committee members. Thank you. Madam Chair, can I speak up? Yes, thank you, Mr. Rivera. Go ahead, Ms. Allard. Thank you. So there wasn't one done in 2016. And so generally what happens is that when a new administration took over, takes over, and at this point it was Mayor Berkowitz, when they take over, they usually do a tax cap calculation audit for each new administration that comes on board. So there wouldn't be one to find for 2016. It would be prior years. So it's been a while. So I don't know. Uh, I, I'll come back with more information of an exact who was the last mayor, and I think it was Sullivan who had done it, but I know during these past six years, the administration hasn't performed one. And it's just a true, ta it's a true tax cap calculation of what we could do better and to save more funds uh, within our organization, meaning the municipality, and it, it helps us. It doesn't hurt us, it helps us. It just shows us what we can do better. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Allard. Um, are there any other comments on this item? Otherwise, we'll go ahead and do some offline work to get that last audit and um, prepare any scoping documents, proposals, etc. OK, moving on to C, Internal Audit Report 2021-03, Annual Municipal Procurement Card Review Purchasing Department. Mr. Chadwick, uh, do you want to take us through that? And again, I just want to remind folks that it is available, the report is available on the Municipal Audit Committee webpage. The floor is yours, Mr. Chadwick. Thank you. This is our annual Municipal P-Card Audit, and we found that overall, most employees adhere to Municipal P&Ps regarding the use of their P-Cards. Um, I think it's important to keep in mind that in 2020, we had uh, almost $20 million in P-Card expenditures, but the total of prohibited purchases and questionable purchases uh, came to about $31,000, so, or $35,000 together with the prohibited purchases. So overall, uh, as a percentage of the, the $20 million, we're not looking at a whole lot. I think it came to about 0.15% of the total. Um, however, we did find some examples of questionable purchases, some prohibited purchases. Uh, questionable purchases included uh, satellite or cable television subscriptions, some online fitness uh, subscriptions, uh, neoprene seat covers for some of the municipal uh, vehicles, gym timers, uh, television sets, appliances such as microwaves, toasters, uh, toaster ovens, some expen an expensive heater, uh, $649.99, uh, some refrigerators, including a $1,699 French door refrigerator, and then one department spent over $1,500 for a coffee brewer and related accessories, including the hardware to install the coffee brewer. Uh, even though the same department had spent about $4,000 the previous year for coffee brewers and related accessories. We also found some examples of prohibited purchases, including $900 for a catered dinner, uh, water, a replacement motor for, the de for a department's fiber optic Christmas tree. And just a note on that one, that the department today uh, we received a check for $15.49. I know that's not a lot, 
but that check was received and deposited uh, as a reimbursement for that prohibited purchase. Now I know that's not a not a whole lot, but I think it's the principle that matters uh, more than the amount, and then it and that people know that someone is looking at their purchases. We also found some retirement badges and retirement plaques. And as I said, although the magnitude of these purchases wasn't significant, the, the public may perceive these purchases as an indicator of fraud or abuse. We also found um, several examples of transactions that were split to circumvent the dollar, uh, the, the dollar limit, the $2,500 limit. Uh, our review, we found 22 purchases totaling about $103,000 that were split into 57 separate transactions. Now, I, I need to say that some of these split purchases were identified by purchasing staff throughout the year, and the PCOL holders were unable to adequately justify their split purchases. So purchasing is doing a pretty good job on trying to identify these split purchases. We then had some purchase descriptions were not always adequate. They just don't tell you what was bought. For example, a description may say document and then have a date. That doesn't really tell you a whole lot. Or for example, one purchase that made at McDonald's, it said witness call out supplies for the purchase description. And we think it's doubtful that supplies were purchased at a fast food restaurant. That is our report. Purchasing has been very proactive in reaching out to the departments where we found these purchases. Ron, would you like to uh, add anything about your efforts? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chadwick. Um, um, Ms. LaFrance, may I comment? Oh, yes, please, Mr. Haddon. Um, first of all, I want to thank Mike and his crew for doing the audit. Uh, it's always important that our employees understand that they're being watched. And just for the committee, uh, some of the departments that uh, uh, were identified as culprits, I have talked with the uh, director of those, uh, pointed them in the directions of where there are uh, as, re as needed reports that they can run. And one of those departments has already started running those. And I want to comment uh, Chief McCoy uh, for what he's done just in the last week. Uh, we have noticed that the department or his employees are now contacting the PCARD administrator if they have a question on a purchase as a result of these uh, as needed reports that they can run. And also want to compliment, as, as Mike noted, uh, uh, Mark Littlefield out of Streets when he, or Eagle River Streets, when he was notified of this, he stepped right up and said, Ron, that was wrong. Uh, I'm bringing a check to City Hall tomorrow morning. And he brought it up. So as we talk to employees and we uh, educate them, uh, those employees and those directors that uh, take this to heart uh, are very receptive and very uh, willing to reimburse the municipality when they make a mistake. And uh, one of the things I'd like to comment on too is uh, the descriptions on some of the items are somewhat misleading um, because, for instance, the purchases that were identified as retirement plaques. Uh, when I talked with uh, Chief McCoy, uh, he informed me, he said, Ron, those aren't required retirement plaques. I don't know why that language is there, but I'm going to correct it. Uh, and you won't see that in the future. Those things that were retirement plaques were actually retirement uh, pins or notifications for an officer's badge. Because as you know, when an officer retires, he doesn't go off duty. Uh, they're like military, they're on call 24 seven, whether they're employed or not. Uh, so these pins that go on their badges, if they uh, have to do something in off hours or when they're retired, uh, that helps them when they uh, communicate with other law enforcement officers that uh, they know what they're doing. So uh, we are cleaning up the language. Uh, 
and the employees, I think, are doing a pretty good job. And we're getting better at avoiding split purchases because employees now know that if they have an item that's going to go over their single card limit, they can call purchasing and we can uh, then authorize that and it doesn't become a split purchase. So I think we're getting better. And when you look at the sheer volume, not just in terms of dollar values of the P-card purchases, P-card program is working very well. Uh, we do, or the municipality does between 47 and 48,000 transactions a year. Uh, and uh, for the members, we also get a rebate of, of that. This year, our rebate from our P-card P company is going to be around $300,000 just from the purchases we've made. Uh, so I have to say the P-card program is a success and uh, I'll be happy to entertain any questions from folks. Thank you, Mr. Haddon, and thank you, Mr. Chadwick. Mr. Rivera does have a question, so we'll go ahead and go to Mr. Rivera. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and um, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chadwick and Mr. Haddon for all your work on this. Um, I have to agree with your statement. It does look like um, you, you are catching these, and um, it you know it does look like this is this is getting better <laughs> slowly but surely um and more and more departments are um more closely following the um internal protocols regarding pay card transactions i guess a couple of things first is um i i would like and and i didn't see it in here um but i would like a uh department um breakdown of um sort of which departments are having the most difficulty still with following the procedures um I, there's a list of departments in here but it, it doesn't really go into detail of sort of here's the the department that's having the most issues having the second most issues etc so that's a breakdown that i would like just to get a better sense of where these issues may be emanating from. And then, you know, I, I will make the comment that um, uh, coffee brewers seem to be something that um, is a frequent thing found on these audits. Um, it was found on this audit, was found in the 2019 audit, and then I believe it was found in an audit prior as well. Um, so, uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that, um, you know, in the recommendations and in the management comments that, you know, folks are losing their privileges and um, we're focusing more on the training and all of those aspects that that will hopefully reduce um, future repeats of some of these somewhat common um, uh, misuses of our P-card system. Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Rivera. And I see that Mr. Chadwick has his hand up. Go ahead, Mr. Chadwick. Thank you, Mr. Rivera, through the chair. You asked about uh, the number of the, the departments. When looking at the, the database, the department that there's two departments that come up frequently. And that would be the police department, which Mr. Haddon addressed, and the fire department. Regarding the coffee brewers, that does come up a lot, as well as other appliances such as refrigerators, microwave ovens, toaster ovens, toasters, those types of things. So in this audit, we made a recommendation this time to, uh, to the chief fiscal officer that uh, he should review and update PMP 2423 to clarify if, if appliances, for example, are a prohibited purchase. And in their response, they mentioned that that PMP 2423 is, is currently under review to help add additional clarification for municipal employees about these appliance related purchases. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chadwick. Uh, Mr. Hedden, you have your hand up. Go ahead, please. Huh. 
had trouble finding the mute, mute button and ended up getting both buttons. So now you get to see my face. Um, as far as which departments, as, as Mr. Chadwick said, it is the police department, the health department, the fire department. We saw uh, a number of uh, purchases that are directly related to 2423. For instance, uh, all of the refrigerators and the toaster ovens and the microwaves that we've seen purchased have been for the break rooms. Uh, and so we are trying to, uh, I have made a recommendation to the CFO that we modify 2043. 2423 to say that those items are authorized because they are in the break rooms and are for all employees, not just a single employee. And it uh, helps morale of employees and employees able to be able to store their lunches or be able to prepare their lunches uh, in their break rooms with those appliances. Uh, now, personal appliances that I would consider, such as uh, toasters and maybe crock pots or frying pans or things like those, I don't believe uh, should be authorized and work. I'd say clarifying 2423 uh, to say that. Uh, the other common item that we've seen have been personal heaters and where we've investigated and gotten down to the nitty gritty on the personal heaters is, uh, for instance, in the police department, they ended up buying some personal heaters, but that was because a boiler went out uh, over by the uh, classification uh, by the uh, call center and they required those heaters so those uh, people could still be working in that area. Uh, so it's uh, some of those things that we're going to try and clarify or not try that we are going to clarify uh, in the future. Thank you, Mr. Haddon. Mr. Rivera, did you have any follow up? Um, other than thanks for the clarification and the additional information, I am good. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mr. Rivera. I put myself in the queue, but before I ask uh, questions, are there any other committee members who wanted to speak or ask questions first? Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Chadwick, and thank you, Mr. Haddon, for that information and further explanation. I just had a couple questions and I wanted to make sure I understand the P card process. Are employees required to get, well, the first question is, are employees required to get pre-approval before making a purchase? And then second, how often do supervisors or is it a common practice to reject um, P card purchase approvals, you know, like after after the purchase has been made. And then actually I had a third question. I, I know we've talked about this a little bit before concerning splitting purchases. Um, I know from my own experience that sometimes employees will split purchases when um, the existing rules don't have the flexibility in order to procure something that's you know really important. It might be um, an emergency situation. So I'm curious as to, you know, what the circumstances generally are for splitting those purchases. So three things. Is there a pre-approval for P-card purchases? Um, do supervisors often reject the P-card um, vouchers when they come through? And then what are some of the reasons behind splitting the purchases? Thanks. And whoever would like to take that one. Oh, Mr. Haddon, I see your hand is up. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I'll, I'll take some of those. Uh, <clears throat> as far as pre-approval of purchases, the cardholder should be talking to their supervisor before they actually make the purchase. And my guess is in practice, that's sometimes happens and sometimes doesn't. As far as approvers rejecting purchases, uh, I can't. Cannot state equivocally that, that that happens, but I'm fairly confident that it does. And then as far as uh, spilling the purchase, I can uh, give you an example today of uh, what happened is the fire department came in and said, uh, Ron, we have a 
a safety issue right now where our hoses, we don't know if they have been tested uh, recently and we need to get a couple of items uh, to test those things and those are going to cost uh, $7,500 each. Uh, we don't want to go through the, or, or we can't go through the normal purchase order process because the vendor's not listed. We need approval from you to do those and here's the reasons why if we don't get these hoses tested, we're going to have to take them out of service, which it, which could impact our service. So uh, they came to the P card administrator who came to me and said, Ron, I rec recommend that we uh, authorize this purchase for safety reasons. I approved it. And those uh, test items are now being purchased. Um, wanted to also just spend a minute on what the process is before you can get a P card. Uh, there is an application process uh, that uh, an indiv individual goes through, uh, applies for the P card, their supervisor then approves it, uh, and then it comes to purchasing. We look at it and look at the department of where it is and make a judgment call on whether uh, that department needs the P card or not. Uh, we look at what the department has asked for a single transaction limit and for a monthly transaction limit, and again, make a judgment call on whether that is warranted. Then during the year, we will, uh, Beverly, our PCART administrator, will go through and look at the departments, who's making purchases, how many purchases are, are being made by the PCART holder. Uh, and then if we did uh, look and say, well, look, this PCART holder is, had a card for a year and they haven't made a purchase. Then we'll talk to the department and most times we're going to deactivate that P card because that's a risk to the municipality of a person having a P card that's not using it. So that's the, pro and then before they get a P card, they come in and go through about a four hour training course with Beverly uh, to where it's a PowerPoint either by teams or in person. Uh, and then they have to pay, uh, pass a test uh, on whether they get a P card. And then uh, once they do that, they get their P card and they're off running. And then there is a requirement, I believe it's every two years that we go through training again. Excuse me. And that's the process for P cards. Mike, I see you look like you may have a comment. Mr. Chadwick. Um, through the chair, what Ron's what Ron has, uh, Mr. Haben has described is what we see happening in the, uh, when we look at the P-card process. I just wanted to add to that, the monitoring of the P-cards by purchasing has significantly increased during the last two to three years. It's not unusual uh, for me to get an email or several emails every week where I am CC'd on emails regarding uh, split purchases that may have been identified by the P card administrator as she reviews P card purchases or other questionable items. And we're also getting more phone calls from different departments regarding uh, P card purchases and thoughts regarding P card purchases, whether we think that this is a questionable purchase or a prohibited purchase or what they need to do with the purchase or how do they go about the purchase. And a lot of times we'll refer those to, to the purchasing department or to someone else to get the proper approvals. But just uh, just in the last couple of years, we've, we've noticed a significant increase in the monitoring efforts done by the purchasing department uh, with the P card purchases on, on a daily basis. Um, so I just thought I'd add that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chadwick and Mr. Haddon as well. That's very helpful information. Um, I appreciate that there is such an extensive process of screening and training and then uh, recurring training as well as the um, inquiries that your office is getting, Mr. Chadwick. Um, that's very helpful. Do members have any other questions or comments on this audit?
or anything else? Um, any members of the administration which wish to add here before we move on? Okay, I don't see anybody raising a hand or in the queue. Thank you, Mr. Chadwick and Mr. Haddon again for your attention to this and your time and um, in a very good discussion, appreciate that. We will then go ahead and move on to D, update on status of the preparation of the comprehensive annual financial report. And who do we have um, for this one? Um, this is Alex Lipka, CFO. Molly is going to present all of this. Um, and I'm just, as a heads up, if you lose me, it's because I lost my phone battery. But Molly is going to give the update. Great. Thank you, Mr. Slivka. Ms. Morrison. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as you can probably imagine, the controller division is working very, very hard right now in the middle of producing our annual report. And um, we're making a lot of progress. Um, just one second, let me get my my better notes, if I might. Um, we we've we've given we've given the auditors um, the financial statements, the de detail statements for all of the funds, and we've given them the capital assets and debt, so they're they're able to audit the major portions of what we're doing so and that's then that um that's that's um what's ongoing right now they're also <clears throat> excuse me involved in the single audit and we're preparing footnotes we have a cash footnote as a draft and we have and we have a lot of the other footnotes that are in draft form and um we have um what else do we have we have been providing them with a lot of backup and schedules so that they can so that they can sufficiently audit these things. And but we need to allow them to audit a few things before we do the final preparation of the annual report because it has a lot of detail in it and we want to make sure that it's accurate. And I don't know, um, Alex, do you think that we should give them an estimation of when we think we're going to be able to issue this report. Because I can't give you an exact time. Um, Alex. Yes, through the chair, I think we should give them the estimate that, you know, it won't be June 30th, but hopefully it'll be before July 30th, is my understanding. That That is our goal, is to, is to be able to issue the financial statements by the end of July. Um, so I think that's important. Great, thank you, Ms. Morrison and Mr. Slivka. Um, does anyone have any questions or further comments? So uh, sometime in July, we can expect to see those financial statements issued, correct? Yes, that is our expectation towards the end of July. Okay, thank you. Appreciate the update. Is there anything anyone else wants to add? I don't see anyone in the queue or any hands up. Oh, Ms. Morrison? I I would like to, if I if I might, um, we received notification last week that we received a certificate for excellence in financial reporting for our 2019 annual report. And I just wanted to um, compliment my staff for how hard they worked on that and being able to receive that. It's an honor. It comes from the uh, Government Finance Officers Association, and it's something that almost all government finance um, departments are very, very eager to receive because it's just kind of an award for having done a good job. <laughs> so we did receive that. 
That's great. Congratulations to your team and um, very happy to hear that. What what was the name of it again? Certificate of Excellence in Financial Reporting. Yes. And that was issued by by whom? Um, the Government Finance Officers Association, which is um, which is an organization of um, it's 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 not a standard setting body like the uh, um, like the American Institute of Cer Certified Public Accountants or like FASB or GASB or you've probably heard I don't know if you've heard those terms or not, but it is a, an organization that's um, <clears throat> spends a good deal of time in helping governments to produce much more um, the produce financial information, not only um, financial reports such as our annual financial report, but also budgetary reports and other things that are more responsive to the citizenry and more clear. And they, they've set some standards that people want to achieve so that they can be recognized in producing, you know, these reports that are that are responsive to the communities that they serve. So, um, and the, every year they also give us a comment letters after they review our financial um, statements. And I'm, I've been led to understand that we provide those to this committee if you're interested in seeing them. Yes, we are. Thank you. And um, that's great news about the award. Congratulations and, um, and thanks to your team for all the hard work. I appreciate it very much. Um, do you, uh, Ms. Morrison, have anything else you wanted to bring up or comment on? Otherwise, I think we, we might. Think so. Okay, thank you. I don't, I don't see any questions or anyone else in the queue or any other hands up. So we will look forward to getting that financial, <clears throat> excuse me, information by the end of July. We are now on other business. Is there anything else that committee members want to bring up? Okay, I don't hear or see anybody. Any unfinished business? We don't have anything listed. Okay, we will go ahead then and move on to audience participation. Are there any members of the public who would like to participate and speak for three minutes, for up to three minutes? I'll just give it a second here, looking at the numbers. Okay, I don't think we have anybody. That brings us to adjournment. Oh, hello. Oh, hello. Mr. Haberman. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. I, well, I guess I was muted. Um, didn't really Go ahead. I, you can hear me now, right? Yes. Go ahead, Mr. Haberman. You've got your three minutes. Okay. I set my timer. Okay. My name is Eugene Carl Haberman. I follow the public process. When the public process is inappropriate, decision made by the governing body is more like the public interest. Um, I thank uh, some member Allard uh, for bringing up the issue of dealing with a, an audit, dealing with COVID funds. Uh, it's, um, I'm glad it's being discussed now, but it should have been brought up long ago because a lot of money has been passing hands to different parties. And um, there, I'm really concerned in this particularly uh, this scenario, which I brought up over the course of time, is that when you contract out other parties to handle the dispersing money and who where it's going to go to, who's going to check them? And there is a conflict of interest to, to some of those parties that you sent the monies out to handle for distribution to other parties and determine who's going to get the money. And one of them is CHAR because they have a membership of their organization. And of that membership, not every restaurant is a member of CHAR. So the end result is going to be is there's a conflict of interest or there's a preference to who they're going to communicate one way versus the ones that are not a member of CHAR. And that's just one example of many. So there you go on that point. Second point is this. Um, the 
accountability of money when you respectfully the assembly, okay, and administration gave approximately a five day window to uh, introduce and go straight to public hearing on the CARES Act money of approximately fifty one million dollars and an S version that was brought out just shortly before the start of the public hearing, that's not giving a chair a chance that that money is going to be spent and wisely directed to. So the problem goes to the right from the start is how you handle the money, decide where it goes, and who is going to be the contracting out. So I fear that we're going to hear a lot of stories out there as time goes by of how there has been a not proper management and how the public was connected before you made decisions. I'm glad the issue of audit is coming up now, and I, I thank Assemblymember Allard for bringing it up now and, and her commitment to it. But the fact is, this is a horrible picture that I hate to see what, what, uh, a, clear, what a clear look of it is going to be as more information comes out and more people address it. Thank you very much, with all due respect, with, 11, with uh, 16 seconds to spare. Thank you, Mr. Haberman. Appreciate your participation. Mr. Rivera. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Mr. Haberman, again for your participation. Um, I just wanted to clarify uh, that several uh, months ago, this committee actually talked about the possibility of doing some types of audits for the CARES Act funds, and was, that conversation was initiated by several members, um, not just one of the members. And um, just to reiterate something that was brought up earlier in the meeting, the Treasury Department is doing an audit of all 50 states of usage of the CARES Act fund. So uh, I think we are all um, happy to see that done, which actually um, alleviates some of the burden from our own staff of having to do such an audit. If there are any additional audits that need to be done, we will consider it as a committee. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rivera. Are there any other members of the public who would like to participate at this time? We do have three minutes left. And it's star six to unmute. <clears throat> okay, I don't uh, hear or see anyone. I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you everybody for your participation and for all your hard work. We are adjourned. Have a great rest of your week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.